Snap Judgment Studios. Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan and writer Josh Johnson are best friends who rarely agree on anything. On the new podcast called Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson, they turn their hilarious, unpredictable, and legendary office banter into a war of words about topics big and small, mostly small, from texting versus calling to club bangers versus conscious rap and everything in between. Listen to Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson from The Daily Show every Thursday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right. An organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. You know that moment when you don't know where else to turn, so you turn on the radio? I know, Snappers, you've had that moment. Now, imagine that you're trapped in a war zone with no way out, no one coming to save you, but you need to know, you need to feel, you need to hear that someone is out there. So, you turn on the radio. The radio station was not very logical idea. Where to put it, how to do it, what's the right equipment, uh, is this doable or not? Muhammad had never set up a radio station in his life. He's a computer programmer with a master's degree from the University of Colorado. But this is his radio station. His idea was to set up a station that could broadcast into ISIS-controlled Mosul. There were a lot of problems with that idea. How, how to reach the city from probably 60 kilometers away and how to broadcast to a city that you cannot physically reach. Nine months earlier, when he and the rest of the city heard that ISIS was on its way, Muhammad had packed his bags in the middle of the night, got in the car, and fled. Islamist militants have reportedly taken Mosul, Iraq's second largest city. Half a million people have fled. In Mosul, the smoldering aftermath of a battle that didn't take long. The picture they paint is of a city under siege. I remember it was about 2 a.m. We didn't have a time to bring a lot of stuff with us. Most of the streets were blocked. There have been thousands of people who've been trying to escape as well. It's, it's, it's unforgettable memory. And one of the most horrifying and disturbing things about the fall of his city was the way that it happened. Muhammad says ISIS, or as they call them in Iraq, Daesh, pretty much won the whole battle with a media campaign based on fear. They were not fighting. They, they lost the city without fighting. It's not logical. You cannot see 60,000 Iraqi soldier, armed soldiers, leaving the city without fighting because media, it amplifies the fear and people were scared from Daesh before even seeing them. Understanding uh, how Daesh use media, they use fear to control people in Mosul and they were very confident that this fear will allow a small group of people of controlling millions and they were so successful. From then on, Mosul was held by Daesh. Families hid inside their homes. People like Mohammed, who left, lived in a kind of limbo. Even though I'm not physically there, emotionally, I feel I was in Mosul. We were unable to do anything. We were hopeless. We came up with so many ideas, like to talk to, to people without putting them in danger. So the idea of the radio station came it's a way of communicating with my people, like 
prisoners under Daesh. But again, the idea for a radio station was tricky. He and his friends built a studio in the relative safety of Kurdistan, but he had to set up a transmitter close enough to Mosul to broadcast to the civilians still inside. Mohammed found an engineer, willing to climb a 100-foot radio tower two kilometers from the Daesh front lines. He made a plan to drive him there himself. Sounds like craziness. Even there was a discussion about whether a sniper can shoot the guy who was climbing the tower and how risky it is. I, I remember it, it was sunset time. I was so stressed. I tried to go over the hardware pieces and try to count it again and again to make sure we are not forgetting any, anything. I was not able to sleep easily that night. Early morning the second day, we had to travel a long way to the front lines very close to Daesh. It took us more than 12 hours to set up the antennas. Mohammed sat in his truck at the base of the tower, solving a Rubik's Cube over and over again for 12 hours. Uh, and I was doing it, I think I did it probably 200 times in that day. <laughs> so I remember it was midnight. He recorded a message on his cell phone, sent it up the tower, then called his friends in Mosul, asked them to tune in to the new station. Like, hello, dear people in Mosul, here is Al Ghad radio station. Al Ghad radio translates to tomorrow's radio. 95.5 FM. Yay, it's a it's time. It's, it's now we are reaching Mosul. Reaching a city which was completely isolated. We were the first radio station broadcasting to Mosul after the fall of Mosul. We are taking a risk with a very brutal enemy. Daesh had banned music from the city. They also banned mobile phones and email and TV and TV satellites, all in an attempt to isolate the civilians, the families still living there. Mohammed station had a signal, but now he needed listeners. He and his team sat behind their microphones and sent out the call to the unknown thousands of listeners held prisoner in their own homes. We are here, we are listening, Call in to tell us what's going on on your street, in your home, in your mind. Because if I don't know who is in charge of this station, I will think thousand times before calling the station. The people who are in charge might be supporting Daesh or they might leak our phone numbers to Daesh. And then, finally, after three hours, the phone rang. And he was... Uh, probably a hero for the station. We're very happy to receive the first call. The caller was a blind man inside Mosul. We were so excited that people listening to the station and some of them decided to be brave enough and call the station. Day by day, we start receiving more calls. And up until today, um, one of the main problems for most of the callers, they will say, we've been trying to call you for one month, but we couldn't reach you. All cell phones and all phones will be ringing the whole time until we, we are out of air. People were spending their very last dollars on phone credits, leaning out of windows to get a strong signal. Allah yainkum, ya Rabbi, Allah yainkum. We received some some requests through messages from people who their house was struck and they were underground. They they request a help and we managed to communicate with the civil defense and they got them out. Some people text us. They will say, we have a sniper, dash sniper on on the roof of our house. Please let the troops know that there are civilians in that home so they will not be striking it. Or we helped reunion a kid with his mom. We've saved a family or helped uninjured people to be treated. And can you explain how dangerous it was for people to be calling in? I mean, would they 
making a call on that on on Al-Ghad radio station could have a punishment which reads a death penalty. So, a single call on Al-Ghad radio station is taken so seriously because we know it was a tremendous amount of risk the caller took in order to reach us. Even just tuning into the station was dangerous. Of course, Daesh don't want the people to listen to the station. And sometimes in their checkpoints, they will force a driver to turn on if the radio to see what was the last radio channel they've been listening to. And what would happen if people were caught listening to your station? So I, I don't know exactly what Dash will do to the people, but we know people be very careful to try to avoid that from happening. They didn't allow to have to sell for people to sell radios in Mosul. Dash dedicated a transmitter to jamming the station's radio frequencies. And then the frequency war started. Mohammed set up a new transmitter solely to jam Dash's broadcasts. And then he moved his own station up and down the dial. But because we were reaching in an abnormal time to a city that's not even under the Iraqi government, so we had some kind of freedom because we were the only radio station broadcasting to Mosul and most of the frequencies were available. So we played with the frequencies for some time and uh, we got even uh, like the technology to change the frequency. I can change it from using my phone. And every day, people found the broadcast. Under the threat of imprisonment and murder, they still called in. Hello. Asmaq yom, tfadali. And one of the things I will never forget is one time we received a call from a woman. Who was crying and it was a very sad call. So she said they were struck and uh, she's asking if anybody can get them out. The woman had a young kid who is five days old. Um, so so she, she was crying because she said like they were underground and they need some help. You know, it's sometimes I, I feel like so responsible whenever I got such a, a request, whether it's a text message or it's a call from someone who's asking us to help with, you know, life and death. And I question myself, why risk my life? Why I'm doing it? Someone on staff here said listening to that call that they felt at the same time very close and very far from the woman calling in. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice uh, expression. Very, very close and very far. One time, we received a call from a woman. It was in Ramadan. And she said, we have nothing as a family. We have nothing. I have nothing to feed my children. So the presenter asked a single question after the call was ended. Ask what the Khalifa like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is eating right now. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is the leader of Daesh. So, in less than one minute, we received a text message saying, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, as they said, God protect him, he's on the front lines and he's eating yogurt with dates. We read that message on, on air, So he knew Dash was listening, and he knew it was kind of an opportunity. For this reason, we came up with a different program called Dash fi Mizan al-Islami wal-Hawara. But saying Dash arba is The program asked listeners to call in to discuss, seriously, the religious and philosophical justifications used by Dash. Because by then, most of the scholars were scared to even address these problems. There was one caller to this show who stood out. We had a, a caller who used to have a different story. 
he used to call the radio station and he was different. He had a great sense of humor, tried to make fun of Daesh many times and many occasions. He was one of the people who refused uh, us of changing his voice in real time. He said many times, many of my family members asked me to stop calling the station just for my security, but I refused. Mm -hmm. This is him, Seymour. If you listen closely, you can hear him say the words telephone and radio. Seymour had not left his house since Mosul fell to Dash. So imagine a person who, who didn't left his house for two years because he was afraid from Dash. Uh, one time, he called the station and we were asking the people a question, what do you th think the people will need after being liberated? He came up with a very different answer. He said, Mosul will need a sanitizer, a sanitizer to clean the streets from what was left from Dash. And the presenter laughed and some callers called after that. And, you know, they were laughing too. But we didn't know that Dash were recording in real time, recording that call. Seymour called all the time until he didn't. Mohammed didn't hear from him for a week, and then two weeks, and then a month, and then two months. We usually, like, mention the name of the regular callers if they don't call, and sometimes we ask them to send us a text message just so we don't worry about them. You know, we feel they are part of the family. I, I remember it was early in the morning. I received a text message from someone the message told him to watch a video online. The kind of video he normally refused to watch. The kind of video that Dash makes to wage its fear campaign. An execution video. Don't go away. In just a moment, the stunning conclusion. Now, today's story, it occurs in Mosul, in Iraq. And there are those who will tell you that the people in Iraq are bad. The folk in Mosul are somehow bad. That immigrants are bad and brown people are bad and the other is bad. But you and I know that it is hard to hate someone once you know their story. And that's why I'm asking you to join Snap Nation at snapjudgment.org and support the show that fights hate one story at a time and get Snap stuff to boot. You can download the Comedy Hour, get the Snap Pin, all kinds of stuff. Because on May 1st, I got to go before the man and put all my cards on the table and prove that this community has my back and wants us to dig deep and uncover the twists and the turns of real people and their extraordinary lives. So I'm asking, support Snap Nation at snapjudgment.org. Not someone else, you, you listening, you're not the type of person that would have someone else cover your freight? No way. That's not the type of person you are. Look in the mirror. Tell yourself you snap. Snapjudgment.org. It feels good, snappers. And you get rid of that burden that you didn't even know you were carrying. I promise. Join Snap Nation at snapjudgment.org because this thing we have is fragile. Fight the dark side with your support. Snapjudgment.org. The conclusion of Muhammad's story it happens right after this break. Thanks. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the Good Morning Mosul episode. My name is Glenn Washington, and when last we left, Muhammad had not heard from a loyal listener in a long time. And Muhammad was starting to get worried. I received a text message from someone. The message told him to watch a video online. The kind of video he normally refused to watch. The kind of video that Dash makes to wage its fear campaign. An execution video. I usually don't watch Dash videos because it's, it's in, inhuman. 
but he asked me to watch it and he said that's very important so I opened the video by the time I saw I saw him I felt it's it's Seymour without even seeing like I don't know him in person haven't seen him before but just seeing in the video Seymour is seen wearing an orange jumpsuit and then to make it very clear why he's being executed the logo of All God Radio appears on the screen. And then the recordings of his calls to the station are played in the video with subtitles. They, they put the calls he was calling the station, they put in that video. They called it calling the disbeliever FM. This is how they described us. And then he was killed in a very brutal way where they forced him, they, he was sank into a tank filled with, uh, with detail, like sanitizer. They kill him by dropping his body into a tank of chemical sanitizer. So they killed him in the same way that he was made in fun of, of, of Daesh to show how, what will happen to the other callers if they call the station. Well, what was the reaction in the station when when you guys saw that video? Um, like we had all the staff came and they said, what shall we do? And some of the staff, staff got very emotional about it. But in these moments, you try to use your judgment and you try to decrease uh, the impact of what Dash wants to happen. Because we knew Daesh were trying to use us to amplify the kill of Seymour and to make sure people are more scared from communicating with the outside. So that was a very hard decision I took. and But it was, I felt I did the right thing. All the presenters talked about him and talked about what did Seymour means to us. The, there was a poetry that was written by one of the um, uh, novel per, per people they work at the station. And also, like, I remember like seeing some of the uh, like staff crying because of that. And what about you individually? Did you, do you remember if you said a prayer or if you cried at all? Um, you know, um, we might get, uh, I think, by living in this country, might get tougher than you expect. Was there any discussion after he was killed about your policy on changing people's voices? See, like, you, we we don't we don't force things on people, and we know people when when they took the risk and used to call the station, they were proud of doing it. They felt they were delivering the hardship they are going through with their real voices. Did you think you got any change in your callers after what happened to Seymour? Any more or less callers? Like all the statistics I got, we start receiving more calls from Mosul. It was a very big deal, like Seymour, one caller of al Ghad radio. And people start telling like we are all Seymour. So if they, if they killed one Seymour, we have thousands of them who are still in Mosul and who are still capable. Actually, Mohammed says, every time things got harder, scarier, more violent, the number of callers would increase. Statistics of what I was getting. Most of the text messages was under very tough situations. We used to get more calls when there was fighting. And people didn't just want to talk about dash and death and devastation. They wanted to talk about music and art and life. Topics people were interested in were news, of course, you have a news, but at the same time, at a spare time, people want to, to escape from the reality and they just want to think about something else and not just thinking about what's going to happen to us if we got struck. Like they had a program called Hello DJ. People would call into the station and sing along to a pop song. 
usually pretty badly. Yalla, down to her. Yalla, Kemli. Yalla, Yalla, Kemli, Kemli. Like when someone, his voice is not good, he will, like, there will be a comment which makes everybody laugh. Like, we'll still, please don't sing again. Or we'll say, like, oh, don't, no, please, you know, like, um, you should do something else. <laughs> it was actually criticized a lot for being frivolous in a dire time and place. Some of the people criticize that we've been doing some entertainment in a time where it's so tense and they think people are going into a very tough situation where if you were singing or laughing, this is out of tune. Like that was not suitable for that time. You need to be more serious. Marhaba. Hello, DJ. Ashonki. It's a valid question. These entertainment programs were a pain relief to the community when it was passing through the toughest moment in their lives. We had some callers who used to call the station and you can listen clearly to the explosions and probably the firing happening in the background and with this guy singing a song or doing a karaoke. And you feel that that's not logical for any person unless he's probably high on, on something. Believe me, it makes, it makes you feel like I was able to bring joy to this person's life and probably there have been thousands of people who were laughing like me when I was l listening to the radio. Once the karaoke presenter even asked the caller, why do you risk your life to call in to our silly karaoke show? The presenter, when he asked him, he said, it is, it's t to us, it is, it's more, it's not a call. It's a way of proving that we existed. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Moni Basu for helping us get in touch with Muhammad and thank you, Muhammad, and the entire hardworking team at All God Radio for your important work. The sound design for that story was by Leon Morimoto, was produced by Anna Sussman. You've reached the end of the story, but the story never ends. Hours of Snap Judgment storytelling awaits your pleasure right now. Get the podcast however you got this one. And remember, this show doesn't happen unless you make it happen. The work that went into this piece that you just heard was extraordinary and it involved a small army of people. So if you dig it, join Snap Nation at snapjudgment.org. Support the show. You'll get great stuff and help us fight hate one story at a time. So stop the world for just a moment and stand up for the storytelling that you love. Snapjudgment.org. Snap was brought to you by the Ragtag Team that made their own pirate radio station. Light some fireworks for the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich. Pat Masini Miller, Anna Sussman, Leon Morimoto, Shayna Sheely, Nancy Lopez, Liz Mack, Eliza Smith, Teo Ducat, Flo Wiley, Renzo Gorio, my name is from Washington. And even though this is not the news, in fact, you could start a pirate radio station and have it shut down by the man, but the man doesn't know about this little thing called the internet and you would still still not be as far away from the news as this is but this is WNYC